Hello, and welcome to this investor webcast on business combinations under common control. We will provide an overview today of the IASB's discussion paper that was published in November 2020, focusing on the topics that are most relevant to investors and analysts. My name is Zach Ast, and I'm an IASB member. I'm joined today by Yulia Fegina and Richard Brown from the IASB technical staff. First, a few housekeeping remarks. As with all our presentations, any views we express today are the views of the presenters and may not necessarily be shared by the board or the IFRS Foundation. If you would like to know more about the project, the discussion paper itself and supporting educational materials are available on our website. This includes a one-page fact sheet that tells you all you need to know about the board's consultation and a snapshot that provides a more detailed overview of the board's proposals. There are three main topics we'll cover today. First, which method to apply to business combinations under common control in various circumstances. Second, how to apply the acquisition method. And finally, how to apply a book value method. In particular, how to provide historical pre-combination information in the primary financial statements and what other information to disclose. We are very keen to hear your feedback. This project aims to provide more relevant, comparable and transparent information to investors and analysts. So we want and need to hear your views on the board's proposals. At the end of our presentation, we'll talk about how you can get involved. Yulia, can you please start by explaining what a business combination under common control is? Sure. So let's first look at a business combination. These transactions are also called mergers and acquisitions. You can see on the screen a simple illustration of such transactions. Holdco acquires e-retail co from Investca. Business combinations under common control are those M&As where all combining companies are controlled by the same party. The controlling party could be a company or an individual. As you can now see on the screen, Holtka acquires e-retail co and they're both controlled by fashion co, both before and after the transaction. This is a business combination under common control. In this project, we are focusing on the reporting by the receiving company in a business combination under common control. In our example, the receiving company is Holtka. Typically, these transactions affect consolidated financial statements of the receiving company. You may not see these transactions very often because they often involve unlisted companies that do not prepare IFRS financial statements. In our example, if Holtke is not reporting under IFRS, you will not see this transaction because nothing changes at the fashion call level. However, in some cases, Holtke may be listed or preparing for listing and will be reporting applying IFRS standards. So as an investor, you might find this accounting in the financial statements of a company that's undergoing an IPO or at a subsidiary if you were to pull these financial statements from a national agency, such as the company's house in the UK. Could you walk us through how these transactions are accounted for today? Uh, yes. So today, business combinations or mergers and acquisitions are covered by FRS standards and are reported using the acquisition method. This means that the receiving company or the acquirer provides fair value information about these combinations. However, mergers and acquisitions under common control are not addressed by FRS standards. In practice, receiving companies use either the acquisition method and provide fair value information about these transactions as in a regular business combination between unrelated parties, or they also use a variety of so-called book value methods and provide book value information about these combinations. In addition, a book value method often comes with little disclosure. So our goal is in this project is to reduce diversity, increase comparability, and to make sure that good and transparent information is provided about these combinations. Now, let me talk about how the acquisition method and book value methods work today to illustrate the full extent of diversity that currently exists. So first of all, I'd like to highlight again that the acquisition method is specified in IFRS standards and the book value method is not. 
So under the acquisition method, assets and liabilities received are measured at fair value. In the book value method, they are measured at book values. Under the acquisition method, all identifiable acquired assets and liabilities are recognized, including, for example, new intangible assets such as brand names or contingent liabilities. In a book value method, only previously recognized assets and liabilities get recognized by the receiving company. Now, under the acquisition method, goodwill is recognized and it is measured as the difference between the fair value of the consideration paid in the combination and the fair value of the acquired assets and liabilities. In contrast, under a book value method, goodwill is not recognized. Instead, any difference between the consideration paid, which companies currently measure in different ways, so the difference between that consideration and uh, book value of assets and liabilities received is recognized in the receiving company's equity. Um, Furthermore, under the acquisition method, the combining companies are combined prospectively from the combination date. The receiving company financial statements for previous periods are not restated to include the transferred company. In a book value method, there is diversity in practice. In some cases, these combinations are accounted for prospectively from the date of combination, just as occurs under the acquisition method. And in other cases, they are accounted retrospectively and the receiving company's financial statements for prior periods get restated. So, for example, uh, this can happen in an IPO to show a track record of the combining companies. And as Zach already pointed out, we will cover pre-combination information and a book value method in more detail later in this presentation. And finally, under the acquisition method, IFRS standards require comprehensive disclosure in the notes, so companies provide comparable and transparent information about these transactions. And in a book value method, little information is often disclosed. And in addition, disclosures are not comparable. Again, we will cover disclosure in a book value method in more detail later in this presentation. So as you can see today, users can receive very different information depending on which method is used to account for business combinations under common control. And just to remind you again, we are talking here about reporting by the receiving company in a combination. Great. Now, why wouldn't the board just mandate the acquisition method for all business combinations in these cases? Well, it's a good question, Zach. And some stakeholders indeed advocate exactly that approach. Although there are also some transactions, uh, some um, stakeholders who advocate the opposite approach, which is using a book value method in all cases. And there are a couple of reasons why the board is not suggesting a single method in all cases. First, arguably, business combinations under common control are not all similar to business combinations between unrelated parties. Second, the uses of information about these combinations are not the same in all circumstances, and we will look at some illustrative scenarios in a minute. And lastly, the costs to companies to prepare fair value information must also be taken into account. As you can imagine, the acquisition method entails significant additional costs relative to a book value method, and those costs may not be justified when there are no external stakeholders that will um, use the information about the combination. And so what I would like to highlight next is that business combinations under common control are common in many jurisdictions around the world. Some types of these transactions might be seen more commonly in some jurisdictions than the others, but there are three typical scenarios that we would like to discuss today, building on the example of a business combination under common control that we looked at in the beginning of this presentation. So first, we will look at transactions receiving, receiving, uh, involving the receiving company whose shares are listed. Then we will look at the receiving company that is preparing to list its shares. 
And finally, we will look at the receiving company that is not listed, is not preparing for listing, but has debt investors. Thank you, Yulia. Now, Richard, could you explain the board's views on when the acquisition method or a book value method should be applied? Thanks, Zach. As Yulia already mentioned, the board thinks that business combinations under common control are not all the same and that users of the information are different in different scenarios. For that reason, the board thinks that the acquisition method should apply in some specified cases and a book value method should apply in all other cases. Generally, the acquisition method should apply when the receiving company has non-controlling shareholders. There are limited exceptions for companies that do not have listed shares. In all other cases, a book value method would apply. Thanks, Richard. And how would these views apply in practice? I'll illustrate with the three scenarios that Yulia mentioned earlier. In this first scenario, Fashion Co wishes to raise additional capital and moves its successful e-retail co under Hold Co. As a reminder, in all three scenarios, it's Hold Co that acquires a business, so it's Hold Co's accounting that we're talking about. In this scenario, Hold Co's shares are listed. Fashion Co is the majority shareholder, so it controls Hold Co, but public shareholders also have a stake in Hold Co. Board's view is that Hold Co should apply the acquisition method to report its acquisition of e-retail co. This is because, from the non-controlling shareholders' point of view, it doesn't matter that Holco and eRetail Co are under common control. For them, this transaction affects their existing stake in Holco in the same way as any other M&A transaction, and fair value information about eRetail Co is most relevant. So looking more broadly than this specific example, our research in the project indicates that listed companies will always have non-controlling shareholders. You mentioned earlier that there are some limited exceptions, but those are only for unlisted companies. Therefore, the board expects that listed receiving companies will use the acquisition method to report business combinations under common control. That's right. To the second scenario. In this scenario, Fashion Co is preparing for an IPO of its retail business and again moves the retail co under Hold Co. Mario, Hold Co is the company that's going to IPO. And although there are no existing non-controlling shareholders affected by the transaction. In this scenario, the board's view is that a book value method should be applied. This is because from the point of view of future investors in the IPO, it doesn't matter how a combination has been structured and whether the group even needed to undertake a restructuring in preparation for the IPO. They would be newly investing in the same businesses, regardless of whether eRetail Co has moved under Whole Co, whether the Whole Co subgroup had been moved under eRetail Co. A book value method would generally provide consistent book value information, regardless of how a reorganization is structured. In contrast, if the acquisition method were applied in this scenario, the prospective investors would receive different information depending on how Fashion Co structured the combination. With the transaction we've just seen, eRetail Co has moved under Whole Co. eRetail Co would be reported at fair value and the Whole Co subgroup would be reported at book value. If it was structured differently, with the Whole Co subgroup moved under eRetail Co, then Whole Co subgroup would be reported at fair value and eRetail Co would be reported at book value. Moving on to the third scenario, this time Fashion Co wants to improve operational efficiency for the Fashion Co group as a whole. It moves eRetail Co under Hold Co. In this scenario, Hold Co shares are not listed and there aren't any non-controlling shareholders. However, Hold Co does have lenders. In this scenario, it has a bank loan and publicly traded debt. The board's view is that Hold Co should apply a book value method here because there aren't any non-controlling shareholders. The presence of debt investors in the board's view should not affect the selection of the accounting method. This is because, firstly, the nature of the economic interest held by the company's lenders is different from the nature of the economic interest held by the company's shareholders. Secondly, based on our initial consultations in the project, credit analysts can work with book value information and the use of a book value method rather than the acquisition method would not greatly affect the outcome of credit analysis.
And finally, if the board were to require the acquisition method in this scenario, that would effectively mean that the acquisition method would be required in most cases, because most companies would likely have some lenders or creditors. I've discussed three scenarios where a business combination under common control occurred and the accounting method that would be applied to each of those transactions in the board's view. I'd like to recap them before we move on to explain how the methods would be applied. The first scenario was a listed company with a majority shareholder. Holco had non-controlling shareholders and so the acquisition method would apply. The second scenario was preparing for an IPO. Holco was preparing to list equity in the public markets but there were no existing non-controlling shareholders and so a book rally method would apply. The third scenario was an internal restructuring where Holco had, had outstanding debt but didn't have any non-controlling shareholders and so a book rally method would apply. Great. And for our listeners, we want to hear your thoughts on whether the board's view on which method to apply would give you useful and sufficient information. And we'll talk at the end about how you can get involved. Yulia, can you summarize the board's view on how the acquisition method should be applied in business combinations under common control? Uh, yes. So, as we discussed earlier, the acquisition method is already set out in IFRS standards, and we also talked about how that method works. So, in the board's view, the acquisition method should generally apply to business combinations under common control, just as it is set out in IFRS 3. So that means that assets and liabilities received will be measured at fair value, and if consideration paid is more than the fair value of those assets and liabilities, the difference will be recognized as goodwill. However, because business combinations under common control are related party transactions, they can have one special feature that is not present in business combinations between unrelated parties. Specifically, business combinations under common control can arguably not involve a so-called bargain purchase. Instead, in a business combination under common control, if the fair value of consideration paid is less than the fair value of assets and liabilities received, that isn't a lucky buy and that difference should not be recognized as a gain in the receiving company's income statement, like would be the case in a combination between unrelated parties. Instead, in the board's view, economically, such an underpayment would represent a capital injection from the controlling party and should be recognized within the receiving company's equity. And finally, one other difference compared to the existing requirements for combinations between unrelated parties is an additional proposed disclosure of how the transaction price was determined. For example, whether there was an independent valuation of the transfer business. And again, this is because business combinations under common control are related party transactions. Thanks. Those are some interesting nuances for these. Uh, next, we'll move on to how a consistent book value method could work and what disclosures could be required. This is an area where feedback from users is particularly important at this stage of the project. We're aiming to provide better information to users and would like to hear what information you need and why. Richard, could you explain the board's view? Of course. The first topic we'd like your views on is which historical pre-combination information should be presented in the primary financial statements, such as the income statement of the receiving company, which was Holco in our previous examples. As Yulia said earlier, existing IFRS standards do not describe a book value method, and there is diversity in practice in how that method is applied. This slide illustrates one approach seen in practice today, the retrospective approach. In a retrospective approach, pre-combination information in the primary financial statements is provided about all combining companies. This means that the receiving company restates its pre-combination information to include the transferred company from the beginning of the earliest period presented. In the example on screen, applying a retrospective approach, Holco would restate historical periods to include eRetailco's net income before the date of the combination. The first half of 20x2 before the combination would be restated to 38 
and the 20x1 figures would be restated too. In discussing this issue, the board noted that pre-combination information about transferred companies could be useful. However, the board also thinks that a retrospective approach would result in hypothetical pro forma information about a group that did not really exist in that form in the past. And it may involve significant judgment and uncertainty and be more costly to prepare. An alternative approach that we see in practice today is a prospective approach. Under this approach, the pre-combination information of Holco is not restated and eRetailCo is only included in Holco's consolidated financial statements from the combination date. This approach is the same as what happens under the acquisition method. In the example on screen, Holco would report a consolidated net profit of 39 currency units for the second half of 20x2, which includes eRetailCo's net income from the date of the combination. The pre-combination information would not be restated, so the first half of 20x2 before the combination would stay at 14 and the 20x1 figures would not be restated either. One point to note here is that if receiving company is a new co and the combination takes place shortly before an IPO, new co might provide only very limited pre-combination information in its primary financial statements. After considering both approaches, the board thinks that the receiving company should include the transferred companies in its primary financial statements only from the combination date. However, the board does not prohibit providing pre-combination information about all combining companies in the notes. Interesting. I've certainly seen as a user both of these presented in the financial statements, both methods. Um, and it's an interesting debate. Uh, I think it's key to note that investors may be able to find those that pre-combination information about transferred companies elsewhere, uh, as I mentioned earlier, but not in all cases. So continuing with that theme of information provided to investors, Richard, could you explain the board's view on disclosures? The board considered disclosure requirements under the acquisition method as a starting point and concluded that only some of them should apply under a book value method. This is because when a book value method is used, the users of information about the combination are different compared to a business combination between unrelated parties. Specifically, the users may include lenders and other creditors and potential investors in an IPO, but they typically do not include existing non-controlling shareholders. Therefore, the board concluded that the receiving company should disclose the name and the description of the transferred company, the percentage of equity interests acquired, the primary reasons for the combination and the book values of the major classes of assets and liabilities received. However, the receiving companies would not be required to disclose information on the fair value of the consideration paid or of the net assets received. The board also considered whether it should specify any additional disclosure requirements in a book value method, in particular, whether it should require disclosure of pre-combination information for all combining companies. The board decided not to require such information. However, as I noted earlier, the disclosure would not be prohibited and companies may choose to provide that information. The board decided that one additional disclosure should be provided. Information about the effect of these transactions on the equity. As Yulia explained at the start, in a book value method, the difference between consideration and assets and liabilities received is recognised in the receiving company's equity. The board thinks that the amount of that difference and the components of equity within which it's recognized should also be disclosed. Thank you, Richard. As I mentioned earlier, we're very keen to hear feedback from investors and analysts on the board's views. So Yulia, why don't I hand it over to you for a final summary? Uh, thank you, Zach. So as a reminder, the board has the following views. First, the acquisition method should generally be applied when non-controlling shareholders are affected by the combination, although there are some limited exceptions for unlisted companies only. And otherwise, a book value method would be applied in all other cases. Second, the acquisition method should generally be applied just as set out in IFRS 3 business combinations, except that in a rare case of a bargain purchase, the receiving company would recognize a contribution to equity rather than a gain in the income statement. 
And finally, when applying a book value method, a prospective approach would be taken for pre-combination information, which is similar to reporting mergers and acquisitions under IFRS 3 today, and some, but not all, disclosure requirements in IFRS 3 would apply. And just to recap, this project aims to provide investors and analysts with more relevant, comparable and transparent information, so we want to hear your views. We ask you to complete a short survey that should only take uh, about five to ten minutes of your time. And we also invite you to take part in our one to one investor interviews to help us better understand what information you need about business combinations under common control and why. To take part in the survey or the interviews, please do get in touch with our investor liaison team at investors at ifrs.org. Fantastic. Well, I want to thank you for watching this webcast. We hope you found it useful. More information on the project is available on our website. And please get in touch to share your views. Thank you and goodbye.